Hi. Well, I was asked to talk about something I know very little about, which is uh, the whole issue of coordination. And uh, so I've um, put some thoughts together on the issue of coordination based on my work um, in different situations uh, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, um, DRC, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and, uh, uh, and then in the natural disaster area in, uh, uh, in, in different earthquakes and then the tsunami in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, as I say, this is not my area of expertise. Um, I think the first thing that we, we have to understand is that we're working now uh, in an area of more visible disasters, uh, whether they're man-made disasters or natural disasters, uh, than ever before. Uh, these data are taken from, and the, the timeline is, uh, is 1950 to, uh, um, to very recently, to about 2005. Uh, these data are taken from Swiss Re. Swiss Re is a company that insures insurance companies. So they collect very precise data on natural and man-made disasters. Um, I think the main thing is that what we're seeing are more and more people impacted by natural and man-made disasters that are occurring not only more frequently, but whose actual geographic scope uh, is, is greater than, than ever before. The other issue, of course, is that these are more visible. They're reported more precisely. They're reported by television more quickly. If we take, for example, the, uh, the tsunami uh, occurring at Christmas, um, 15 years ago, it would have taken maybe two weeks before we would have heard about the tsunami and its impact. Uh, in fact, what happened was that literally overnight, CNN and others were reporting more precisely than WHO and other organizations were able to uh, provide information on, which had all sorts of implications. Uh, one of the implications was that, uh, of that uh, was that the data that the international agencies, the UN organizations, used for many weeks were data that were at times spurious and which were generated by television companies and television reporters rather than by systematic epidemiological analysis of the situation on the ground. Um, and that, I think, is going to happen more and more as we move forward in this area. Um, and I think if we look at what is happening uh, this week, uh, last week in, uh, in Haiti, I think we're getting a repetition of that situation. The media is faster than the international community in getting to these situations. Um, I think it's also important that we look at coordination from the perspective that we're living in an era of um, the imperative to intervene. Keep in mind that prior to the end of the Cold War, humanitarian assistance did not exist as such. Uh, the Red Cross was the only organization that was operational in either natural disasters and far less so in man-made disasters. Spheres of interest, Soviet Union on the one part, United States and allies on the other, had pretty much split up the world and dealt with uh, disasters, very often militarily and very often causing them militarily. That has all changed and I think that today uh, we are almost obsessed with the need and the desire to intervene from a humanitarian perspective. Now part of this is because there is an ideological imperative to intervene. Ideological, whether it's religious or whether it's political, uh, whether it's part of the zeitgeist in which we live today, but there is a, an ideological belief that it is our responsibility to intervene on the basis of human rights, the right to health, the, right, the human security notion. Um, 
But there's also behind all of this a growing political imperative to intervene, and I think that has become very clear now in Haiti, where one of the main actors is the United States and acting militarily. In other words, providing military assistance in a humanitarian context. But don't for one second believe that this is particularly new. Um, in Bosnia, one of the problems that I ended up having was that um, I would spend a lot of time at night, like we all did in shelters, and uh, one of my sleeping partners happened to be a French military engineer. And, um, and we became quite good friends, and, uh, and I would share a lot of information with him on the health situation, the evolving health situation, um, the way in which the infrastructure, physical infrastructure of uh, Sarajevo and other cities was deteriorating. And it was not until right at the end of the war that I understood that he was not military. He was a private sector engineer, recruited by the French and put into uniform for that process of mapping out what would be required in the reconstruction and recovery phase. Now, I use that as an example. He was not by any means alone. Just about every peacekeeping operation involved civilian engineers in uniform for the simple purpose of mapping out the situation in these, uh, in these countries. And this is something that we need to keep in mind, that there is a political imperative. And it may well be that we're returning in one way or another to the old spheres of interest um, uh, policy that was uh, the case during the Cold War. And there's also an industrial imperative, and that is related to what I've just said. Reconstruction and recovery is a huge business. Um, and towards the end of the war in Bosnia, I was approached by Japanese private companies who were willing to pay quite large sums of money for information on where uh, there would be the biggest need for, uh, for physical uh, reconstruction. Now, the other point that I want to make, however, is that the organizations that you, that I work with, also have an economic imperative, and that is survival. And this is a very, yesterday I said I would be very cynical. Um, do not miss or do not underestimate the fight for funds from organizations that you work with. Uh, and do not underestimate the extent to which organizations that are in other uh, ways extremely altruistic and well-meaning, at some point or other, will fight for funds and will do strange things in order to um, get funds, and I will give you examples uh, later on. Um, finally, I think that we have to put all of this discussion into the context that we're working in an era when the capacity to intervene is superior than ever before. It is easier to fly uh, materials and people in, it is easier to truck materials in than ever before, it's easier to get from A to B uh, than ever before. Um, so this is reflected in a way in the, uh, in the pattern of development assistance uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 or so uh, years. Um, a pattern of assistance that is significant in terms of both real um, figures and, um, and, and relative um, figures relative to uh, gross national product.